key is for Atlanta to have a workforce development program that can move people out of poverty and into career paths the same way New Jersey did for my mom, but keep them there. She took all that and went to Florida. But if Atlanta can right. do that and keep them here and then taking that affordable housing component, so now they can move out of their apartment into a home that's affordable, then now you have that poverty rate going down. But that's life-changing stuff. That's not just a political talking point. My brother Clarence, Terrence, Chris, and Charles don't remember poverty. That, that's Old Testament, New Testament stuff. To me, that's where we need to be. Forget banning cigarette smokes in Atlanta or no more scooter rides after nine. That's bullshit. Right. We need to be focused on big, transformative things. And I don't know what's on the dock for that right now in Atlanta. We don't know that vision, what we're fighting for, or are we just waiting on the next thing to protest. Like to me, what's that next big, transformative thing? that we're all engaged on and fighting towards. That's where I think Atlanta needs to be. And I just, it's tragic that we, we don't have that. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. My platform when I ran for office yeah. was education reform, criminal justice, mass yeah. transit. That's Teach it. kids about money at an early age, financial independence, literacy. Now, nutrition. I couldn't think of a more vital time that people would like to learn about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you need to learn about money and food. Yeah. Food and money. Really start with the food. Thank you guys for tuning in. I've got an excellent episode up ahead for you. Welcome to the 16th episode of the Mr. Atlanta podcast. I have Mr. Corey Ruth with me today. How are you doing today, Corey? Quite well, man. Quite well. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's good to see you, my birthday brother. Yeah, good seeing you, man. Yeah, I think the last time we did That's see right. each other was on, on our, our birthday. shared That's birthday, right. yeah. August I think, 21st. I think two years running, I think. Two years running, yeah. We just yeah. met like a couple yeah. months before it, yeah. the first yeah. time. Yeah. No, no, no. Three years? 2019. It three years three years. Right. Yeah. three years running. That's three right. Three years yeah. running. Yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you come to the party? The birthday party? I came party? to your birthday That's party, right. your campaign event. Yeah. And, you know? um, and so that would have been the three year three years ago. Mm-hmm. So yeah, three years. that was at that venue over off of Otley by Sweetwater. It, yeah, and Republic. Yeah, yeah what's that's that it. place? I can't remember the name of it, but a friend of mine is on the board or is an investor and suggested it, and we did it. And it was just really great venue. So, mm. Yeah, yeah, it was a badass venue for sure. Yeah, I mean, I I don't even drink, and it was great. So oh yeah. word, yeah, it's a brewery. Nice, yeah. 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 So tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a, I guess, first uh, husband. My wife is uh, Dr. Ruth, mm. <laughs> and uh, she's an epidemiologist. Then, uh, you know, I have three children. Uh, my son, uh, who's in the studio, uh, Josiah, and, and I got two daughters, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Uh, my son's 18, and um, um, I run a consulting firm. Uh, we do, we're a boutique consulting firm. We do a lot of international work, do a lot of work with Fortune 500 companies and Global 100 companies. We do everything from uh, you know, a lot of a lot of consulting firms do verticals. They specialize, very narrow specializations. We we have more of a concierge approach. Um, mm-hmm. So we do everything from mergers and acquisitions to sales transformation, global sales transformations to cybersecurity audits and I mean we do a ton of stuff and uh takes us all around the world it's really fun and um that's that's what I do. Wow. Yeah. Expand on that like cybersecurity. Yeah so um our specialty in the cybersecurity area is uh providing sort of chief of staff services to um technology executives. Mm-hmm. So if you're a chief security officer or a chief information officer, even a chief technology officer and you are faced with, um, you know, a portfolio of projects for uh, that center around hardening your cybersecurity for your company. Uh, you bring in one of us, and we will sort of manage that portfolio for you, and all of the projects and tasks and activities and personnel that's under that, and uh, and budget that's under that. And so we we do that for technology executives. There's also audits, cybersecurity audits, compliance requirements uh, for uh, credit cards, like uh, payment card industry has a set of security standards, data security standards, or regulations like uh, GDPR, which is the 
which is a European privacy regulation. Um, and so we help uh, companies also become compliant mm -hmm. with those regulations and uh, standards. So. so I'm sure you're familiar with the Marta hacks. Yeah, That went down, what, yeah. six months ago? Yeah, yeah. It was... Well, you know, a lot of the... So the credit card transaction yes, sir, and then, process. And Sorry. Yeah. Trying to central off. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, through the credit card transaction. Yeah, and so and a lot of the um, municipalities and government agencies that are being hacked, um, you know, 98% of all hacks aren't really hacks. They are social engineering. Somebody made a uh, mistake by clicking the wrong link or uh, in, in thereby giving access to uh, their credentials and, and uh, there's one story where a woman worked for uh, MIT, um, she used her, she had been working there for a long time, she used her MIT email as her login for Facebook or some other social media site, I don't think it was Facebook. They got hacked, found her MIT domain, hacked into MIT that way. So I, I a lot of it is, you know, human error mm. and, and just fishing, know, fishing and, um, you know, uh, social, social engineering. And so and that's the type of attack. So I think Probably one of the most effective of all it's the most effective. Why would you try to hack through someone's firewalls when you can just get them to give you their access? Unsolicited exactly. free. Exactly. <laughs> Here so, you go. So really, the, so really cybersecurity is is less of a technology problem, still a technology problem, but less, it's much more a human problem. Mm -hmm. like what, what can we do to make sure people are aware of this, make sure people are sophisticated when they use the internet, ultimately. That's what, one of the reasons why I advocate um, uh, cybersecurity training from K through 12. I think as we make the American population more sophisticated, um, those are the people ultimately that go to work for corporations and for governments, and they then bring that level of sophistication to the corporation. Corporation increases it through their own training, and it makes this sort of social engineering much more difficult. Mm. So with the Marta hack, uh, one of my pledge brothers from Georgia State is, he works for Assurance Point. Okay. Um, and he's been there for like six years. Yeah. He works with the Dallas Fort Worth municipalities, the airport, yeah. like probably fifteen different cities around yeah. America. Um, and part of with uh, cybersecurity. Wow. And so, this is public record, so I yeah. can talk about it. Yeah. But he can't even come on my podcast. Wow. Like, he can't come on here to talk about it. Like, wow. Yeah. He can come on here and talk about other stuff, but yeah. it's just not worth it for him. Yeah. No, um, but, we, but what I can say is. Basically, they were hired by Marta mm -hmm. to go through and do stress tests. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm not Is sure. Is this post breach or pre breach? Pre breach. Pre breach. And so they went through and found some vulnerabilities yeah. um, between processing credit cards and the hex codes. Yeah. Storing information and also like the admin login details for wow. Marta. Or as simple as like admin for the admin name and password was like Marta one two three four five. Yeah, literally, yeah. that was their password. Yeah. <laughs> so that um, the company went through and did the stress test, and on one side it went through and, and broke, like messed up the whole thing, and it was all errors on the inside. Yeah. And this was like what a year after the city of Atlanta was hacked yeah, not, by the not ransomware not hackers yeah, for, right, yeah. for, what was for it? nothing. Like what was that, 50,000? I, I mean, we lost yeah. what, $100 yeah. million? Dollars? Yeah. They don't even know it the true been, impact. It could have been juveniles, uh, probably. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I got a friend yeah. that hacked the, the CIA when he was 12. Wow. He, he got arrested for it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But him and like a group of kids hacked the government. And it can be done. But, it's usually by the youngest kids are the ones that are the most savvy or daring. But again, like I said, I mean, most of it is social engineering anyway. You know, so I mean, the ones that are like really hacking in the way that you think of it are like state actors, right? And in these like 
really sophisticated groups like uh, Anonymous and stuff like that. And, but the state actors, like, you want to see a hack, you know, you look at what happened to Sony with, with North Korea. Like that, that's what happens, with, you know, what could happen with the state-owned actor. Or what happened when the U.S. and Israel were rolling a who hack Iran uh, and they literally use radio frequency to to access uh, their uh, nuclear uh, system and they basically shut down some of their centrifuges using a hack. They turned their system into a robot essentially and got it to turn on and turn off and to speed speed up the centrifuges or slow them down or whatever they got to do. And it set them back, said I ran, I ran back in the nuclear development uh, some period of time. So that was, that was a really sophisticated hack. That's wow. not what you're seeing. It's a long game hack too. too. Yeah, it is. But that's not what you're seeing happening. Most of the time when you hear about a breach on TV, whether it's Marta or City of Atlanta, you know, you're not seeing this type of sophistication. You're seeing uh, the DNC, when the DNC got hacked, uh, um, or, uh, or Hillary's emails got hacked. I mean, this is somebody clicked on the Bank of America phishing email, and it gave access, and that's how they got in. So this is this is stuff that we have to fix uh, in terms of our human behavior. I agree. I love that. How do you feel about Cambridge Analytica? Well, you know, the, what I what I think about this is um, I think about Cambridge Analytica from a social media perspective um, and how our data is being collected by the Facebook to the world um, and you know what what are they doing with that data how are they protecting that data and when you know that so much of these hacks are happening through social media like we're putting all of our information in the hands of people who, um, like the young lady at MIT, may be using her job email as her as her uh, username for some personal. Do you know how many data points they collected on Americans? I don't. I, the way I see it, is, have you seen the Great Hack? I did not. Okay, no. so it's been I, on Netflix for yeah, a little bit. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I started. I'm sure you know about Facebook getting yeah, fined sure. a billion dollars and all that. Yeah, but my, the way I see it is. They got 5,000 data points. Yeah, but all of your data points hand are delivered already, for half of America. But already, all, all of that's already out there. And the, the way I see it. Well, is, they did surveys. They did phishing yeah, surveys. Yeah. They got people to fill out these really long. Yeah. I saw it. I started to do it. I remember. <laughs> I saw. I was like, "What?" Is, and you I saw. And I saw like my friends reposting and stuff, and I was like, "Is this really gonna fuck that? I'm out. Like, yeah. Man, nothing." I, and I feel like I've been like that for, for probably five years. Yeah, just like, not trusting. No, like yeah. question everything, yeah. anything on the yeah. internet. Cool. If it's if it's trying to get all this data that it already has, yeah, then it's something fishy. Yeah. Well, we we did a um, uh, assessment for a client in Mexico, and what we found is that there's a culture there that is um, you know not trusting of. Um, of the internet. And by that, I mean, you know, putting information on the internet the way we do, uh, we're very trusting. Uh, this okay. site looks credible. Let me plug in. Or I want this piece of information or I, I, I want to access this content or whatever it is. And you want that bad enough that when it pops up the form, you're willing to plug your information in to gain access to it. Um, so in the U.S., we're very... You know, trusting of that kind of stuff. Whereas, uh, yeah, in, in Mexico, what we found during that assessment was that they were very averse to that. Um, and talk about credit cards. While we were down there, we found that you know they don't even hand their credit cards to the server, um, and the server walk away the way we do here. They the server brings the POS system, the point of sale system, and they find right, it right there. So there's a I think we need a cultural change. Mm -hmm. We need to take we need to take cybersecurity very seriously. I think it's a I think part of it is is government 
but I think it's more education than, you know, a new cybersecurity company that has a great new model. And I say that as someone who is a reseller of cybersecurity technology, but the, if, 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 you, if a corporation hired someone to run cybersecurity, a chief security officer, information security officer, and they came in and said, here's my great plan. I'm going to do very rigid training for everyone. It's just not sexy enough. The, I think the board wants to hear that you're bringing in user behavior analytics or something like that, and that will make them feel more comfortable. But the reality is you just need to make sure when you get hired, you think about like your first job, you get hired at like a shoe store or, um, you know, I was at a grocery store. I got to go perfect. What's the first day? It's sitting in, sitting in the manager's office, watching a video about leakage. You know, people stealing, people dropping and breaking things. And basically, the not message, taking tips. Not taking tips. <laughs> the message, My pleasure. I'll take your groceries out. That was the, that's the weirdest thing about Publix. Is you got to walk into their yeah, car and then not, not say, like, money. take this yeah. money. Shoot, I took the money. Man, dude. <laughs> and then I left that Publix to get a job. At Publix no, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Yolo. My sister worked at the same one for a little bit. Yeah. I left that one on my break to go to the Old Navy. Both shit jobs. Wow. And then went to the Marinas. I worked on Marinas for about yeah. three years. But they're very serious. High school. That's a little day, different. Yeah. They're very serious at letting you know that, look, if we lose product because of you, you're losing your job. Right. But on the cybersecurity side, we don't we don't send that same message to mm -hmm. employees that there needs to be training and there also needs to be real rigid enforcement. Like people need to know if I do something stupid that can compromise data, I can lose my job. And and I'm not saying everyone needs to lose their job because the phishing uh, uh, techniques are very sophisticated and can get the best of us. Okay. But there needs to be a level of um, you know, accountability there. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right, so let's back up and dive into your candidacy for yeah. Atlanta City Council, yeah. the post two That's right. yeah. citywide position. Yeah, you ran as well. Right? I ran for District, district 5. District, okay, District 5. Who won that district? Uh, Natalie Mosby Archbong. That's oh, right. She, but she was uh, 20 year incumbent. incumbent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And she, had a, she had a number of people running against her. Me, her, and Liliana Fox Tahari, okay. who I ended up endorsing about a month yeah. before and she lost by like 260 votes. Really? Yeah. Wow. How many people voted in that district? Not a lot, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. I guess yeah. um, she lost by 260? 400 people. No. So 52,000 people live in the district and can vote. It's more people live there, yeah. right? But registered voters. Yeah, registered voters. 5,200 people, no, no, 5,600 people actually voted. Uh, yeah. 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 Wow. yeah. Well, it's yeah. abysmal. It's, it's, it's better, like, it's anywhere eight to 12%. But that's better than some of the districts in Atlanta. 8%? What? No, listen. Oh, uh, other ones? One of the, one of the city councilmen just won and only like three or 400 people voted. Antonio Brown. Yeah. So. Yeah. And how many people were running for that spot? A ton. Like 20? They're carving up. Like It was like 20 people. It was for Julian Bond. That's right, yeah. Is he you passed, right? That's right, that's right. So for his scene, his wife was running. I and I thought that she was going to win. Yeah. Everybody thought that she was going to yeah. win. Was, Greg was, Clay, was, too, I thought. But we was going to win. Yeah, few votes. I mean, who knows who's going to win. I'm yeah. glad Antonio did, yeah. though. I'll tell you that. I don't know if I, if I know him. He's a man. I didn't know him before. Yeah. But I reached out to him on Instagram um, before an event. And he, like, got back to me very thoroughly um, about what I was asking. It was about when they originally banned scooters after 9 p.m., which is still in effect. Yeah. In Atlanta, uh, I asked him some questions about that. And so I've gone to a few events. I'm yeah. in his, close by his district now. Okay, um, okay. In West, yeah. West Midtown over here. Okay. And so, yeah, dude, I couldn't I couldn't be happier with him. He's okay. truly an incredible well, I see, inspiration. Yeah, I see him speaker. everywhere. I should follow him. He's everywhere, dude. Yeah, everywhere. he's, he's yeah. I mean, he's he's one of the people. Yeah, he's ubiquitous. So. Absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, we got these, like, you know, some of the, like, one through four 
five districts. Yeah. You know, the, the old white ladies that don't. I, I mean, you know. Well, I mean, I, I, look, I, how do you feel about it all? I feel like what Atlanta's lacking right now, and, and, and this is a bit of irony because this is the cradle of civil rights. Um, and uh, it took some vision to make that happen. And and then behind that vision was, was action, right? It took a lot of organizing, a lot of courage, a lot of um, just do it, you know, like mentality. And I feel like our city right now just lacks vision. Like, like where are we going? And, you know, I just don't really understand that piece. I mean, you know, uh, for me, I, I something like early childhood education. Um, that's a very difficult thing to do, typically. But Atlanta is smaller than Memphis. I know we go around talking like we have six million people, but we only have four hundred twenty thousand people. To right, and well, it doubles every day from commuters of people course, working here. Of course, yes. Nine and it's six million in the, in the greater the metro. metro. Yeah, so for every but morning, here in the city, it's only four hundred twenty-eight people, and it's wow. never really more than that. It's like really it's that. Yeah. it's been around four hundred k for 400 time. 15, 20 years. Yeah. And so and so we're in a unique place where we can actually do stuff for less money than what it would take for New York or Chicago or LA, a lot of cities that we get compared to, right? To, to do. Yet New York has done early child education. Chicago has done early child education. Where are we? We have 13,000 kids at any given moment between the ages of two and four. And we're not providing those 13,000 kids with early child education. Now erase the 33% of kids that don't get uh, uh, free or reduced lunch um, in, the, in the school system. And you're down to 9,000 something kids mm -hmm. that need early child education. Some of them, we presume, are already in early child programs that are qualified programs. So you got even less than that. And so for me, it's like, can we get a resolution to say it is the priority of, of the Atlanta City government to have early child education? Here's another kicker. 1,400 kids are already getting early childhood education paid for by the state of Georgia through the lottery system uh, and, and executed by the uh, Atlanta Public Schools. So now those are four-year-olds. So now you say, gosh, can we go to Brian Kemp, whose first campaign ever, he ran on early child education. Can we go and sit down with Brian Kemp, Governor Brian Kemp, and say, hey, you guys are already investing, I think, $7 million. Can you increase that? And then can we get the city and the state to kick in similar amounts so that we can so that we can actually do this? And I just think we 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 have a city that does a lot of culture signaling. You know, so they, they like to, you know, protest or, you know, they like to, you know, engage with uh, celebrities. They like to do a lot of things that are culture signaling and virtue signaling. Peacocking. But not doing things that matter. And to me, I'm like, let's do something significant. You know, and I think something like early child education uh, is on the scale of what, um, those civil rights leaders did. Mm -hmm. And what is the civil rights issue of our day? It Tell is me. inequality in education. And to me, until we can do that, we talk about the crime in Atlanta. And the crime rate in Atlanta, on a per capita basis, the murder rate in Atlanta, is no different than Chicago's on a per capita basis. No different. Really? Yeah. When you look at what New York City did, New York City is the safest big city in, in America. America. In the world. In the world. What did they do to turn that around? It wasn't in the 80s, right? 
what they did, everybody talks about stop and frisk. I credit Bloomberg that in a lot of ways. Well, before Bloomberg, it was Giuliani. Right. But he did a lot, and Bloomberg carried it on. But you have stop and frisk. But they also put a thousand new officers on the street every day. They became a massive surveillance state, right? Atlanta is doing some of that, right? We actually are one of the top 10 most surveilled cities in the world. You know what? Surveilled cities really? in the world. Uh, only two uh, American cities made that list. Uh, I'm sorry, two non Chinese cities made that list, and that's London and, and Atlanta. No way. Yeah. What? Yeah. Eight of the top 10 most surveilled cities in the world are in China, and then London and, and Atlanta in the top 10. Atlanta's number one in America? Yeah. Behind New York? Or? No, most surveilled cities. So, okay. meaning how many cameras per person mm -hmm. do you have at Atlanta's? Gotcha. Yeah. Where's yeah. the study from? I don't know where it's from. I'll get it over to you. When, what? What that does, I, I'm actually a supporter of that. Now, what that does. I'm not against it. Is we need we're to, already posting it yeah, we're ourselves, posting it. you know? But my, if they really want to find you, they're going to go to your social media and catch it. Yeah. And and that's that's, that's what the investigators do it. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of like, I think you, there's a step too far, like facial recognition. I, I, you you got to make these cameras smart. There's certain things you have to do. You just can't have cameras, right? Um, I have a, a, a camera, so we have, we have like six the cameras around. Doorbell. Or we have like six cameras around our home, mm -hmm. plus one that's in the community, or two that's in the community. So that, so we have four, and then there's, then there's two hanging out there. Then our neighbors have cameras and stuff like that. A criminal was actually captured because the police officers used our cameras. So so cameras are good, but we do assessments for clients, and you know. This client that we did in the before in Mexico, we go down here and they have cameras. We have to, let me see the feeds. Well, they're not storing. So just having cameras, they'll work. But if you have a level of storage, uh, data retention, logging, right? Alerts, so the sort of cameras are alerting you when certain behavior is happening, or you have like tag readers that can read a tag. That's important because typically when someone breaks into your home, they drive there in a stolen car. So if they, they are captured on a tag reader before they get to your home, that tag reader sends us signal to the police department, the police department geolocates the coach's officer, they get pulled over before they get to your home, that person goes to jail for a stolen vehicle and not for breaking into your home. So that types of those types of smart city stuff, I think Atlanta is, is on the forefront of. We're doing some really good stuff around that. Gary Bradley, the CIO, Samir, prior to him, you know, really good job at that. You got gunshot detection. Somebody shoots a gun. You got detectors that can geolocate where that happened, send a signal to the police officer, the police can surround. What kind of detectors? Gun, gunshot detectors. Really? It can detect gunshots. We have like microphones around the city? Yeah. Sensors, readers, it's IOT, like, the, like your watch. Really? Yeah. And so the, this is, you know, sort of the components of a safe city that I think we need to have in order to get crime down. Mm -hmm. But that final component that New York did that we haven't done is early child education. And what we Stop know, press. what we know is when you put a child through early child education, they're less likely to be committing crimes mm -hmm. when they become teenagers. My daughters and my son actually, but my daughters, five and three years old, they are in a very good early childhood program that is a learning program, not a daycare. It'll be there from two years old to three years old, three years old to four years old, four years old to five years old, and then they go to kindergarten. And they are going to be competing with kids, mostly on the south side of town, whose first day in school will be kindergarten. You already three years behind my daughter. Mm. Already. Three years. Plus, my daughter has parents who have advanced degrees. They have uh, a brother in high school. They have, um, they've been in a really uh, good early childhood education program. So, the amount of words they speak, uh, their comprehension level, 
their ability to capture reading and writing, all that stuff is going to be out of the roof. Now, that kid on the South Side in a room with my daughter, and at some point, that young girl is going to say, I'm not on her level, and I'm never going to catch her. And when that when that calculation happens, that's when they start exploring alternatives to the path that we're all trying to get them on. And so when you you want to break that, you don't want them to feel at some point that I'm never going to catch these kids. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get serious about early child education in the city of Atlanta, or we can keep, you know, virtue signaling and culture signaling, which is great for Instagram, but not so great for the kids on the south side of town. Uh, one more thing about that. Atlanta carries a persistently high poverty rate that exceeds 20%. Even when we had influx of people to our city, the poverty rate is still above 20%. So um, we need a city council that is going to say poverty's at 24% in Atlanta. In the next four years, we want to get that down to 23%, or 22%, or 21%, or 20%, right? I thought it was in the 30s. Each of those, percent, it, it, it could have gone there during the Great Recession. Who knows? I mean, it always goes up and comes down, but typically we're right around 20 It's not just the south side. The west side is one of the most abysmal. Sure, sure. Educational centers in the city. Uh, I started mentoring at Grove Park Elementary in 2008. Yeah. Um, my freshman year at Georgia State. Yeah. Because we got extra credit. Yeah. <laughs> we went through a whole letter grade. But it's really bad. It's really and it's bad. terrible. Yeah. Um, I was like one of three or four guys. Yeah. Out of 100 people, all girls pretty much. Um, so you're talking about the. But yeah, Grove Park. And every single Friday. In that lunchroom, yeah. there was a fist fight. Really? Elementary school children, Corey, you had kindergartners literally ducking each other. Yeah. I was with the third, fourth, and fifth grade, freshman sophomore junior year, and it was just and with X3 Foundation, we go out there to the John Lewis and Victus Academy. Oh, X3. Mm-hmm. Which is a whole nother story. And it's a whole nother story. <laughs> yeah. And they have this ah, he got ripped. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I lost a lot of weight. Um, and you'd think that the John Lewis Invictus Academy would be a grand, amazing school, but it's still one of the worst in the city. Yeah. It's suffering still from the cheating scandal to eight years ago, and it's awful. Yeah. Like, you got eighth graders that can't read, they're literally illiterate, and they still get passed. No child left behind. One of the worst things that ever happened in Georgia. So what was your platform running for office? It's, it's kind of nerdy, but <coughs> early child education was yeah, a big one. It's number one, I'm sure. But the other one was that the city of Atlanta is one of only like three cities in America that actually have a population that's less than 25% of the metropolitan population. In fact, ours is like 9% of the overall At metropolitan population. That's right. That's right. Six mil, That's yeah. right. So for every one person that lives in Atlanta, nine people come into Atlanta to access our resources. Everything. Our so the people like me that live in here and after a decade have to have this extra burden. That's it. That's Sorry to interrupt, but I feel no, very passionately about it. That's it. Well, and you got these out of county motherfuckers and Cobb and, and Gwinnett and wherever coming in and they get paved roads and the best schools, lights, officers, you know, trash cans. Yeah. We don't get any of that. Yeah. And then what's funny- And we pay for it for them to have it down here. What's funny is they come in, they, they're like, you talk to somebody, they're like, I hate it there traffic, they traffic sucks, where do you live? Alpharetta. So you hate Alpharetta traffic. <laughs> you don't hate that they traffic. Absolutely. <laughs> so, well, you don't live in Atlanta, you live in Alberta. You drive into mm -hmm. Atlanta and you hate that drive. Right. So, we're moving to Atlanta. So, <clears> I <throat> love it over here in West Midtown. It's like yeah, it's reverse commuting yeah, to kind of everything. Exactly. 
Uh, if you all don't times, have to drive yeah. out of the city, you're driving against traffic and you see all the, the guys coming into the traffic from Bro, the suburbs. Yeah. It's nice. It's great. I've lived off of Peace Street most of my life and coming over here, up 75, down, you can get up to 400 or 85 real easy. Get a 20 easy. I mean, I have to take the highway, go to Marietta or Northside. I can take Howell Mill. Yeah. It's, I okay. can't believe, I mean, I guess what's been town wasn't. I was going to ask you about the area. What, what, what's the, uh, Berkeley Park. Yeah. Andre Dickens. That's it. Okay. And he's he's that guy, man. Well, he's um, a good dude. you know, if Keisha runs for re-election, that's one thing. If she doesn't, or, sure, sure. or four years from now. Sure, sure. Well, I don't know. I mean, if Biden wins the presidency, I could see her taking a cabinet position. Biden's not going to. Well, that's not going to <laughs> is there a Biden marker? Oh, really? Her Biden? So weird. That? Oh yeah, oh yeah. She's been going hard for him, man. Mm. But where, where are you on the presidential side? Well, <laughs> so when I was running for office, I guess somebody on Keisha's team when that she was yeah. running to added me on like Instagram and everything, mm. and. um I think I know who it is, but so she only follows like 340 people. Yeah. And so I have people all the time like, yo, the mayor follows you? <laughs> like, what? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, bro, you know, my man named Keisha. <laughs> 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 Even though I voted for Mary Norwood, um, yeah. my mentor and one of my main mm. uh, donors was, yeah. was big with her. Okay. Um, it was just kind of where we were aligned, yeah. but yeah. honestly, in retrospect, I'm really happy Keisha's married, not me. Yeah. I think Mary has dementia and <laughs> she probably takes Clonopin too much. Yeah. I don't know though. But what about presidential? Yeah. Ooh, so I haven't really talked about this on my podcast, um, but this is the perfect episode too. Well, would you consider yourself Republican or Democrat or independent? independent? Okay. Yeah. Now, what does independent mean? A lot of people say that. like. They only voted Republican and they're like, I'm an independent. Or they only voted Democrat and they're like, well, I'm an independent. But what is, okay, it's one thing to be ideologically independent, mm -hmm. but where's your voting at, mm -hmm. typically? So I had the honor and privilege of running as yeah, an that's independent right. that's right. municipal yeah. election, yeah. which is awesome because yeah. I get to just write for the job. That's it. You and know? who you want to be. That's it. But 88% of my district and like 75 percent maybe 80 Democrat. of Atlanta's Democrats. Right. Yeah. So if you don't have morals that align with that and values, you're not gonna win. Yeah. And you might as well not run. Well you could. Well I think you I, ran as an I ran as an opinion, but I think the the um American party structure, you have two parties. It's disgusting. It's the worst in the and, world. Well actually I think we need a third party. I, I think we need no parties. I think we need four parties. Four. Why? So, because ultimately, no matter where you are in the world, no matter how many parties are in the country, and people, oh, we got 24 parties in our country. We got 50 parties in our country. Don't matter. At the end of the day, two people are going to win. They're going to have to consolidate from those people. So you end up with two parties anyway. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter. So what the founders said, the, the founders did not determine that. Like we have more than one, more than two parties in the U.S., we just have two major parties. And the founders were concerned about factions. And so they felt like people would be too partisan with parties. So some of the founders didn't even want, want that to happen. Like, they had everybody run as an independent. But it doesn't even matter if anybody ran as an independent. Ultimately, you're going to get down to two parties. You're going to get down to two people who are the top vote getters. And in order to gain the power over the government, they're going to have to coalesce everybody else. Yeah. yeah, and you're going to end up with two parties. Just like a primary. Just like a primary. Yeah. So what we have in the U.S. are two massive parties. And the, the objective of a party is to win elections. The Democrats and the Republicans have no values. The Democrats were anti-gay marriage before 2012. Hillary Clinton was, when it came to abortions, I just want them to be safe and rare. Like, this is the Democratic Party. Democratic Party. But when it's popular, 
when they think they can pull that coalition together to win, that's their job is this person's running for this office as a Democrat. We're going to find groups of people that we can bring together who disagree on a lot of different issues. But we're going to find the thread that can weave them together into a coalition that can win an election. That's all a party exists to do. That's why I don't put a lot of stocks in parties. So you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, I'm a Republican. Who the fuck cares? At the end of the day, we just found two mechanisms that can weave together groups of people to help us win elections. That's it. If you want to know where I stand, you probably don't have to listen to this podcast mm. or Google me. I like it. Or you, can <laughs> you can't look at freaking Donald Trump and say, this must be what Corey believes. Because we got people in the Republican Party that's as liberal as anybody in the Democratic Party. And there's people in the Democratic Party as conservative as anybody in the Republican Party. You just made the point. 85 75, 85% of the residents, or at least the voting population in Atlanta, is Democrat. You don't think there's some people out there who are Republican that ran as Democrats so they can win an election? Of course. Of course. And you don't think that's happening? There's 52,000 local governments in America. You don't think that's happening all over America? So you don't think there's people who ideologically are further right that are Democrat or ideologically further left? When, when Gillibrand from New York replaced Hillary Clinton as the New York senator, she was from upstate New York. She was pro-Second Amendment. She was anti-gay marriage, right? She was pro- I don't even want to talk about pro-life. Things, right? But I'm just saying, it's, 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 so none of that matters. I don't fuck with any of them. None of that matters on the political side, mm-hmm. which party you go with. What matters is what the individual believes. Mm-hmm. That's that's all it boils down to. And if you really want to be a sophisticated politico, right, as a citizen, and you want to like really learn how to navigate democracy, you you're gonna really get down and saying, what does this person believe? Because I can't look at their party. I don't, I don't suspect that Donald Trump is really a Republican. But he ran as a Republican. I don't suspect Bloomberg is really a Democrat. He's been every party. Yeah. He's literally been every party. Ran yeah. at all three. So to me, I'm, but the you asked me why I think we need four. So here's why. When Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton ran, everybody was afraid Bernie Sanders might run as an independent. Now, don't do that because you're going to throw the election to Donald Trump. You'll split the Democratic vote. Well, what would have happened? If Bernie Sanders had run as a Democrat and Mitt Romney had run as a Republican, now you got two Republicans and two Democrats, they each split votes, then you look more, then you got a situation where the two highest vote getters will win. And no one can say you split the vote and gave the advantage to the other side. So we don't need three parties, we need an even. I like that. So that's why I said we need four. I think the American system wouldn't work as well because we don't have a parliamentary system. So it wouldn't work as well with like 26 uh, party, prominent parties. But four, I think we could, we could, we could work. And I, and I don't think, I think you saw the real effect of that in this last election. Right. Like if a mid All right, or, so let's, I have one more question on the yeah. national level and I wanna go to local. Yeah. So with the impeachment, it's, Probably happening right now. Yeah. Um, this this week, this weekend, the House is going to vote on it, and it's going to pass. Then it's going to go to the Senate, and it's going to fail. Yeah. He's going to get impeached, but still be in office and have the opportunity to be able to run again mm-hmm. with no real oversight. That's well, what Adam Schiff said on. Stephen Colbert two nights ago. Um, it's pretty much what the consensus is across the board. Well, he will have oversight because, so we because we have a separation of powers. So the problem But he's is, not letting any of the executive branch testify claiming he had he has that authority. And then right. and then the con- Congress, if they don't like that, can take that to the court. That's what the courts are there for, to referee between the other co-equal branches of power. He's a co-equal branch. He doesn't have to listen to Congress. 
I know they think they, I know they think he does, right? But they don't. And guess what? When Obama was in office and they subpoenaed his attorney general, he did not go. And that's just how it works. And if you don't like it, go to the Supreme Court. And if they think it's worth it, they'll bring it up for review and we'll have a groundbreaking constitutional decision from the Supreme Court. Until then, that's not going to happen because kick bricks. Right. Yeah. It's a co-equal branch. Somebody just died, right? Um, a Supreme Court justice? Uh, Are you feeling? <clears throat> yeah. Or well, did they just step down? No, no, no. So you, you're talking about um, where he put, um, yeah, someone died, uh, Scalia, and then they they uh, backfilled him. But uh, so you're you're suggesting that the Supreme yeah, Court. Yeah, he was is a Democratic voter. No, he was a Republican, actually. So you're saying that the Supreme Court is more conservative than. It's got to be, yeah. Yeah, but that historically on the big decisions hasn't have, have mattered. Really? And when you look at the Supreme Court and you say, which people on the Supreme Court, we know where three of them are going to go. We don't know where four of them are going to go. We know where another four of them are going to go. There's maybe one or two that swing. And he was one that usually swung. I bet. He, he, won, he, yeah. was, he, was, he stayed in the center and Kennedy. And then, but Scalia was straight down the middle mm -hmm. to the right. So both, you yeah. know, Trump had two uh, people to a point. But I, th I think, uh, when you look at the Supreme Court and who swings, it's the ones who were appointed by Republicans, not the one. Ginsburg, she ain't swinging nowhere. Sotomayor ain't swinging nowhere. Cagle ain't swinging nowhere, right? But when you look at the ones that the Democrats put on, they're not swinging anywhere. It's the it's the Justice Roberts who's who's a swing vote. You know, those are the ones that are going to surprise everyone. But but I don't think that's the issue. The issue is. The, the executive doesn't have to obey the legislature and the other way around is true as well. The co-equal branches of power. That's why the founders did it that way. And that's where the oversight comes from as well. Impeachment is an oversight mechanism. Now, what he should be, what he should be saying, Adam Schiff, is not that after we impeach him, the Senate's going to reject our impeachment. And then he won't have oversight. That's your fault. Why do you use impeachment now, knowing that you don't have enough evidence to swing some Republican senators to to remove them from office? Well, that's where everybody who wants them out is hoping. That's is it. That some that, Republican senators, but you, but you have to have, have some but you integrity have to have evidence, and background. But you have to have evidence that is so clear. That oh, quid pro pro? I I just I feel like impeachment. This is not for impeachment. Now you have you have ten Democrat Congress people who are saying let's censor him, right? Say what you want about what happened on that phone call. Say what you want about what happened during that whole um, Ukrainian situation. The law when they passed the uh, appropriation for the Ukraine, the law said that. The money had to be sent to the Ukraine by September 30th. It was. At the end of the day, it was. So there's no broken. No abuse of power. I mean. So I digress. Let's uh, let's get on the local level. So what happened to Kim on your birthday, on our birthday? Yeah. Well, let me just say this by impeachment, just to summarize, because I, I don't think I was clear about where I stand on it. I think impeachment is one of those things that should be preserved for the most despicable, despicable of leaders we've ever had. Donald fucking Trump. Behaviors, Trump. behaviors that we've ever had. And racist, bigotry. I, I, I don't agree with those assumptions. You don't think he's a racist? Absolutely not. Now, let, let me challenge you on this. I'm glad you brought that up. <clears throat> how long have you known Donald Trump? Like, through media. Too long. How long? Like, how old are you? I'm 31. Okay. Donald Trump has been in national media since the 80s, early 80s, right? I grew up watching Donald Trump on TV, and I grew up in New Jersey, so I was constantly watching him on local news. Like, I, Donald Trump has been in the American imagination for 30, 40 yeah, years. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Okay. All right. I digress. Okay. Go ahead. So, 
What, what happened to Kim on our birthday? What happened? He was supposed to come and somebody. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So we did a political cocktails. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> political cocktails is an event where uh, we set the stage for a prominent politician to come and engage with young professionals. And um, we had uh, Governor Kemp uh, slated to uh, be our, our special guest. And um, um, gracious to um, Greenberg Torrey, uh, the mm-hmm. law firm for hosting it, it really swing. Oh, I loved it. It was beautiful. I took a bunch of pictures. It was great. <laughs> they also pitched in to help with the catering and the alcohol. That food, it was um, really great. God. Um, <clears throat> and, and Warren, um, I can't remember his last name, but anyway, he. Uh, he actually did the um, catering and did a real good job. So, you know, contact David if you want it. I'll be too good. We'll, uh, we'll get y'all in. Yeah. How often so, is it gonna happen? We don't have like a cadence. So it's it's just when we can pull, I mean, think we pulled senators and governors and people like that, cabinet level folks. And so it's when we can get them. Uh, but, so we we were supposed to do it with Kemp, and um, there was a an an emergency that pulled him out of um, the region. He had to handle something in a different part of the state, and so we ended up uh, we happened to be with uh, Senator David Perdue. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we got word and he agreed to do it. So it just worked out really well. And it was an amazing event. Senator David Perdue was incredibly thoughtful and, and knowledgeable about the issues. And it's a not, even though it's called political cocktails, it's a non-political event. Like we mm-hmm. did, we, like we, you and I were just talking about politics, like, you know, electoral politics, who's going to win, who's going to lose, impeachment, all this kind of, this is all, you know, legislation. Like what's going on with the China trade deal, right? And stuff like that. And I think a lot of people, they believe that young people and minorities aren't interested in serious issues. So whenever you see politicians get in front of young people and minorities, they want to talk about race. They want to talk about, you know, all of the virtue signaling stuff, right? But we want to hear about trade. We want to hear about you know, wars, we want to hear about, um, you know, immigration, we want to hear about tax reform, we want to hear about the budget, the deficit, the, 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 the debt, we want to hear about all of that stuff, and the Supreme Court, and so they Purdue not only was a really good guest to answer those questions, I mean, he made it, made it cool, so it was okay. really, really good, so, so. but we are still Where do you get your News. All right, so you ready for this? <laughs> Morning Joe. Well, now I just replaced Morning Joe with Squat Box on CNBC mm-hmm. um, in the morning. And then I go to, um, it used to be Shepard Smith during the day, but now it's Andrea Mitchell. Um, and then I go to, in the afternoons, Brett Bear. I may do like a um, um, Chris Matthews, um, when I feel like getting heated because he, he has a really good show. Um, so I, I bounce around from a cable news perspective. Um, once it gets to opinion time in the evening, I'll, I'm, I'm mostly Fox News on that. Um, and then for reading, real care politics. And I basically try to just go through the list of. Um, articles that they have from all different angles. Um, so I try to try to get it from from all over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you ever read The Economist? Yes. Very good. Very sort of academic, intellectual. Even when they're far left, sometimes you don't even realize. I can't even tell. Yeah, you true. do a good job. Yeah. Yeah, I've been a subscriber for about a decade. Yeah, I think so. they do a really good job. I've done the cable stuff and I can't even 
Yeah. I don't have the capacity for it. I yeah. watch, I, I pay for YouTube Premium, which is like the most worth it thing really? ever. Oh my God. I have a family plan, so it's like two fifty a month. And wow. no commercials, just streaming YouTube. And it starts to really learn your personality and your appetite. And like, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, machine learning. Well, <laughs> it's YouTube. I mean, and so you, you watch a few of the, um, you know, different episodes and, and videos and stuff that you like. Yeah. And it'll really start to tailor it. So I get all my news from The Economist and YouTube, pretty much. And then I'll dive into other stuff. Well, I'll tell you what else I watch that I don't really share, but I'll share it on here, but is um, Al Jazeera. And yes, dude, Russian I love Al Jazeera. And RT, Russian television. RT. So I think both of them, I think Russian television breaks down really badly when they get to the opinion or editorial stuff. It's, it's really bad. But their news, their hard news is really good. Al Jazeera is really good. I don't even know how you can consider cable news a provider of hard news anymore. Bro. No, you, you see, that's the thing. When and it's just to, like it's, it's many small little yeah, parts of it. You know what? It's, it's like going to the it's like going to the um, barbershop band. I mean, you you get into these conversations and you learn things, but you have to you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones. You know, and and to me, I don't eat meat. Yeah, <laughs> to me, when when, it, when you're really busy and you don't have time to do a lot of Hard reading, and you don't have. I just listen. Read. Yeah, you, to me, you get on the, you listen to what's going on, and like I said, you have to eat the meat and, and spit out the bone. Like for instance, I will uh, listen to say um, the the IG report came out, mm -hmm. and I watch that on Fox, and you get a perspective, and then you flip. And turn to CNN. Once you, okay, I got the perspective. I see what y'all saying. Then you flip and turn to CNN. Turn to let me see, see what they're saying. But I'm gonna tell you the best hard news is CNBC. And I are you gonna say like NPR, no, UABE? Man, NPR is. I know everybody. The Georgia it. Gang. The Georgia Gang. <laughs> I saw you. So, I, like I said, I stay on YouTube. If there's some important shit that goes down, I usually see it. Yeah. And all about the local stuff. I listen to Rose Scott. A yeah. closer look like crazy. I think that's one of the yeah. best. Yeah. If you really care about Atlanta. And that's on NPR. Right? It's on NPR. It's an additional station through yeah. NPR. If you really care about what's happening locally. Yeah. Then that's. That's it. That's it. Okay. Um. But yeah, so I was just scrolling through YouTube uh, a few weeks ago, and I've been asking you to come on the podcast yeah. for like two months, yeah. maybe longer than that. Sorry, and I was like, "This motherfucker is on on TV," <laughs> and, you know, because they take yeah. the syndication. And I was like, "Okay, yeah, yeah screenshot it, threw it up." And I think it just happened, like the wow. night before. Wow! And I was looking at it in the morning because yeah. YouTube, like I'm telling you, man, it's on. I gotta check it out, man. I gotta check it out. And I got and I gotta actually. Uh, you need to put free alerts for your name. Like, I actually got a free I got an alert for my name up, right? Oh, yeah? like Google okay. alerts, YouTube alerts. Well, I got a Google alert, but I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got to check that out. Josiah, I got to help me out with that. <laughs> <laughs> He's at it. Good. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think um, in terms of news, how we consume news, man, it's so important, man, because I think everybody is kind of like they have their certain news that they receive. I think the other important thing, I when I came out of high school, I wanted to be a theologian. Why? I wanted to be Cornell West. I wanted to be a public intellectual. Mm -hmm. And- um, What happened with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Money. <laughs> I sold my soul to the devil. Ooh, <laughs> so, um, but what I liked about that is um, I learned, how how not to trust my sources. Mm -hmm. And and so for me, I feel like too many people trust their sources. And then the second thing is too many people um, are too rigid on what they believe. Like you you should come to every debate with the, the concept, and this is a theolo theological concept, a Christian theological concept, is that sin is so pervasive in our lives. 
no matter who we are, so pervasive in our lives that it affects every part of you, including your thinking. So there's something that you believe that is flawed. And if you come to the debate, come to the argument, knowing that, then what's your goal? My goal in this debate, in this exchange, is truth and clarity. That's it. Understand what you're saying. Be clear, clarity on what you're saying and make sure you're clear about what I'm saying. And then with the goal of obtaining truth. And I spent three years debating a guy and changed my religion. Three years debating the same issue. Every time we saw each other, knocked down, drag out, argument about theology. And then after three years, I had moved away from what I believe to what he believed. Wow. And so to me, you know, people who are Republican or Democrat their whole life are, are people who, who are playing team sports, right? Um, or they are people who are not very deep thinkers, mm -hmm. one or the other. And my encouragement is if you don't make your money in politics, don't play team sports. And if you um, don't play team sports, be a thinker. You should not be in the same party your whole life because you went from living with your parents to living on your own, to being in college, to getting married, to having kids, to getting older, to retiring. So the policies of one party is not going to help you all the way through. At some point, you should be like, oh, right now, I'm in college I, or I'm a young professional and I have college debt. Maybe the Democrat platform on college debt, that's the most significant thing in my life right now, is better for me. But then when you get married and you have kids, you might say, you know, this Republican family tax credit over here and this, that might make sense for me. So, and then what you're doing at the national level might be different than state and local level. So you may be voting Republican nationally because it makes sense for you as a family man. But then locally, you're like, Keisha Lance Bobbs. So it, it just, to me, we have to be, just like we're talking about cybersecurity, much more sophisticated mm -hmm. as a population. And where we are in America today, say with Donald Trump, is just we're not a sophisticated nation. It's that simple. Obama, Bush, Clinton, they all could have been better presidents than they were the public demanded more of us than playing a saxophone in our studio hall. <laughs> well, at least he's going to press got it. So what is your relationship with Brian Kemp? I've known Brian, uh, Governor Kemp for about 10 years now. Um, he was running for Secretary of State <laughs> at the time that I was running for um, I say walking for U.S. Congress because <laughs> um, I just got sick of yelling at the TV and I just ran for office. <clears throat> and uh, and so um, I said I was walking for Congress, but he was running for U.S. Senate and we would be at events together mm. um, and uh, ended up kind of building a relationship. After he won, I lost. We... Um, Started doing some work together, um, you know, bringing him to different groups, kind of like the the kernel of political cocktails. Okay. Um, but Brian was the first one um, to do that. Nice. And um, we did that a couple of times uh, together. And um, yeah, and it just kind of grew from there. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's interesting you ask it because I totally forgot about that. So I'll let him know. So it would be like, you were the first one that I did this with, and then when we bring them, it's like now you're governor and, and, and you have political contracts. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, he has been an interesting person. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, will focus on forward, the future. Okay. okay. And um, his capacity to be able to 
alter the narrative and his position in that to best benefit his political future, um, especially being wise with Georgia becoming such a purple state. A few of the things in that are his views on marijuana. Okay. Specifically, um, Georgia being the first state in the nation to have low cannabinoid oil cards provided to people. Um, being one of the most regressive states with policy towards marijuana, having a Republican governor who is progressive in thoughts of it. Um, I have a buddy that I met. His name's Essex Lumpkin. He's been on the political scene for a while. He's like 35, 40. Um, he is on an initiative right now. Basically, Kemp told him and his crew that if they were to get 50,000 people registered for low cannabinoid cards, that he would start passing legislation for the legalization. Um, do you know anything about that? I do not. Um, I can say that um, there's some very sympathetic people on the Republican side in the legislature around uh, legalization of marijuana. I think it's very early and people are trying to be cautious. They don't want to rush into anything. They want to make sure that they are evaluating the places that have already legalized it. What's the effect on, you know, driver safety? What's the effect on um, grades and, and test scores? What's the effect on, you know, just healthcare in general and crime and all these kind of stuff. And, and a lot of that seems um, if, if you're somebody who smokes marijuana uh, recreationally, um, a lot of that seems crazy because you're like, I'm not a bad person and I don't do this. I don't get into car accidents, I, you know, but uh, as a government, you want your government to be, um, you know, mindful of all of that. So they're trying I to- I appreciate speak. that, but you can look at a lot of states that aren't having that problem. Do you know uh, Congressman yeah. David Clark? Yes. So, talking about, oh no, yeah, he was, I met David at yeah, your event, yeah. 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 Talking about, um, he's a state legislator, yeah. Uh, isn't he a congressman, representative? He's a representative at the state level, not, not at the federal level. So, gotcha. Yeah, so they're called representative, not congressman. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, Rep Clark um, is very pro yeah. marijuana, and so I called him like a year ago, and when some of the stuff was start, first starting to go through, I think the decriminalization mm -hmm. city of Atlanta yeah, was, right, was, yeah. was a big thing. I was like, yeah. yo, man, how can I help? Yeah. And one of the things he said is to keep awareness up about yeah. the medicinal side. That's it. Because a lot of these states are legalizing it medicinally and then recreationally, yeah, and the yeah. money from the rec side is coming through so largely yeah. that they're yeah. taking a second seat for the, the medicinal, the medicinal yeah. true positive effects. Yeah. So what do you think Georgia's future is for that? I, I definitely think the future of the U.S. is, is legal marijuana use uh, for recreation as well. And I think Georgia is going to be on the, say, early adopter, uh, not early adopter, but they'll be, they'll be one of the, among the first tracks that goes uh, full in on that. Mm -hmm. Even though we're, you know, Historically Republican, slow to adapt no, state. You look at you look I, at you Governor think. Nathan Dale with criminal justice reform. Um, so for marijuana use, um, the folks that are in jail for marijuana use, you know, the non-violent criminals, uh, their sentencing guidelines and stuff have drastically changed. Um, city of Atlanta with with the uh, decriminalization. What I wanted to make sure is that as we're doing this, we're reminding um, the people, users, and people who sell that <clears throat> decriminalization means that you get a lesser fine, I mean, a lesser penalty. It doesn't mean that state trooper is still illegal at the state level, it's still illegal at the federal level. Companies may still test you and you may not get a job because you have it in your system. So people just need to be aware that decriminalization doesn't mean legalization. legalization. And legalization doesn't mean socialization. Oh. So that's I like very that. important because yeah. if a company is still saying, I'm not hiring somebody with this in their system, you just have to be aware of that. So I, I, <clears throat> I'm i cool with it. And let me tell you where my frustration is. It seems like marijuana is on track for all of that, right? Legalization, 
and socialization. Meanwhile, the nicotine is going in the other direction. I know it's very dangerous, but I'm a cigar smoker. And I'm like, come on, you know. Right. Yeah, now we got technology that doesn't allow for secondhand smoke, and they, they're banning that stuff too. <clears throat> so I, I, and we found out it wasn't the nicotine that was killing people using vaping, it was the marijuana that was, <laughs> yeah. Fake street ones, right? Exactly. So to me, it's like you didn't see the media or the, or the medical complex, you know, trying to correct people's idea on that because they, there's this real disdain for nicotine. Uh, you know, alcohol is a drug. Uh, it kills people. Uh, it ruins lives. No one's trying to ban alcohol. And I'm just like, come on, guys. I think we're going way too far on the nicotine side. I agree completely. And, uh, I think it's because of the aggressive ads towards kids and some references yeah. that are getting teenagers who are nicking yeah. in school. Either that or they're, or they're growing it in the industry is, is in the southeast and they give a lot to Republicans, one or the other. That too. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I wish that there would be more hemp farming and growing. I know that's interesting. It's one of the most it's powerful people, right? plants. Yeah, hemp. I got hemp in my kitchen yeah. right now, dude. That's yeah. Hemp milk, hemp yeah. seed, it's the best. Yeah. Um, but back to marijuana. Yeah. You know, the MLB just took it out of their drug screen. So really? Major League Baseball, Baseball yeah. no longer will be marijuana well, screening. Is I'm happening. finding too that, that three days I'm ago. finding too that a lot of our clients um, aren't testing for it um, for jobs as well. So it's it's being socialized. It really is. It's huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very big. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear about psilocybin being decriminalized? What is that? Legalized in Oakland. What like, is psilocybin? Psilocybin is the active ingredient in mushrooms. Oh, okay. So I heard about this. Yeah, I heard about the shrooms being legalized. Mm -hmm. So that's what's being Psilocybin, legalized. right. Okay. All right. Now, see, this is the thing, especially getting back to my frustration with nicotine. So I'm like, so wait. We're bringing nicotine is legal. <laughs> mushrooms become Mushroom, illegal, right? Mushrooms are legal. Sure. I think it should pretty, pretty much all be legal, honestly. I'm I'm more of that, like, step back, like, legalize the prostitution, uh, no, no, like that. Like, prostitution would probably be safer if it was legal in America. Well, I know that I've lived in Spain, in Korea. They have the red light district. And seen it. Yeah. And seen how much more safe it is and the lack of real problems with it. I think human trafficking would slow down. I think that rape and, and so many terrible things would not be as bad. I mean, it's legal in some parts it's of America. Parts. Um, I cycled across America in college what and that mean? I rode a you bicycle. Rode a bicycle across America? From San Fran to DC. Jesus for Christ, how long did it take? Two months. <laughs> yeah, <but that's laughs> Jesus. I know, yeah. I did it at 19 and then 21. How many, how many, wait, how, how long did it take to like, get to a state? And I know they're different sizes, but like on average, like. So Nevada, weeks, I guess. Nevada was like 11, nine days. Texas was 11. Most states were like three to five. Cali was like six or seven. And how often um, are you riding? 85 miles a day on average. Three teams of 35, yeah. we split up the country, and we so kind of zigzag. You are obviously with them by yourself, but, um, so you had like a team of people that were riding. Oh yeah. And y'all was, y'all had it mapped out, you knew where you were stopping, mm -hmm. you stayed at hotels and stuff like that on the way mm -hmm. there. Friendship, or we would stay at like YMCA's, Civic Center, you know, wherever, like wherever that. they would let us stay for free, pretty much. Okay. Usually like a gym, something yeah. like that. Um, Every once in a while, we'd stay at a hotel or, or a fraternity house, yeah. but generally not, as it was yeah. like 35 fraternity guys yeah. doing this. You know, we already have like enough temptation. Let's just keep them on the bikes. And, you know, our whole thing is like getting rid of the stigma of frat guys. Yeah. You know, like we're, how, how, we're raising awareness and money for people with disabilities. And how was, uh, you know, bike breakdowns, tires, all that kind of stuff? How did y'all kind of keep your your vehicle work. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. So we went to San Fran um, 10 days before the event uh -huh. and trained and okay. went through like 
everything, yeah. how to break it, exactly. like train yeah. A, you know, like real quick, you had yeah. to be able to do it in a certain amount of time. Yeah. And so the first time I did it, I bought my bike like a week before. Wow. <laughs> wow. So you really I, I literally, I was doing spin class and kickboxing yeah. and running and, and swimming and all these different things just to get in shape. Yeah. But the actual development of callus yeah. on my butt and just getting in bicycle. Wait, wait. so talk about that. So basically, I'm a, now, I'm, now I'm, a, I'm the interviewer, but I'm just yeah, yeah that's how it goes. Yeah, I'm really curious about this. Though. So basically, when you sit on a seat like that for we were on it for you know, eight hours a day yeah. on average, the callus from your feet or your hands kind yeah. of goes to your ass. Really, your taint, your grundle is what we call it. And so at first, if that thing is raw or fresh, it it hurts. And my biggest problem the first time was. I bought my bike from uh, this Jamaican pilot, Air yeah. Jamaica. He sold it to me for 50% of what it was worth. Wow. And it came with an extra pad in the center of the seat. Yeah. When you're supposed to have a slip, no pad. So your fallopian tubes can breathe. Yeah. So I got this thing called Sleepy Peepy, which is basically you can't feel your penis. And I have it for like two days, Lauren and Callie. And Did I you cut like, it out? The, cut the thing out? Um, the, the cut my dick off? No. <laughs> <laughs> the extra pad? So I had to get a new saddle, a new seat. Okay. Um, but I was 19, you know, I couldn't feel my penis. I'm literally like, what, what is happening to me? So I reached out to an older guy in the team and he's like, dude. Wait, this happen. happened while you were? Yeah, dude, like in the first few days. Wow. Because like, if you don't have the right gear, you're screwed. Yeah. And I did it. So I, re- I re- like immediately, as soon as I found out, wouldn't change the seat, got my feeling back, you know. Wow. I actually ended up being one of the fastest cyclists on the team. Yeah. But yeah, did, it was probably anybody, the most physically. Did anybody quit along the way? Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, they just like, I, that's. <laughs> I mean, we had people in the rest of the if, if, I mean, some people quit like that day, right? Like, I can't I finish can't this ride. Finish like, state. Right, you know? Yeah. So, if that happened, then you weren't allowed to ride into the city. Like, every time we got to a city, we had like a police escort. With, we had seven crew vans that had our stuff. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, did you have um, any vehicles? It was seven crew members, 28 cyclists on each of the three routes. And so they would, you know, their our map, our route was already mapped out. It was like 20 years. I did the 19th and 21st anniversary. So we knew we were so going. They always do this. Yeah. But every year you have to go through and retrace yeah. your route yeah. to make sure so that we, yeah. construction, construction, new roads, new roads and just everything, stuff, yeah. all the stuff. Yeah. And so we were um, logistically pretty sound with it, but it was the most mentally enduring thing wow. I've ever done. For sure. I'm sure. Um, and once you know you wanted to have that last one mile ride in, where you know, I mean, we reached over ten million people. Wow! Through like direct contact yeah. and media, um, wow. and that was like eight years ago. Yeah, when it was that's probably more now. Um, yeah. So you know, you got like thousands, but tens of thousands before, of people lining up. That was before like smartphones. Really yeah, I had the first iPhone, the first yeah. time I did it. So yeah. yeah. And so you y'all were really like, discouraged. Y'all you were like, you know, bro, not, <laughs> not doing, I had like a regular Camera waterproof, under, like under, Sony Panasonic. Under, um, steering. Um, I had a mount, yeah, put on there. It was so bouncy. Yeah. Um, I just had a really good waterproof camera. So I, got, I did get a lot of really good pictures. And that was like the best thing about it, you know, just goofing off, not just riding to ride and get there fast, you know, like get off the bike, take some pictures, enjoy the moment. We got to see some of the, that's the reason I love Atlanta so much, because I've seen there. Yeah. I literally yeah. rode a bike across it and yeah. seen twice. Yeah. 38 in the States. Yeah. Atlanta, I think, has the most opportunity oh, yeah. of any city oh, yeah. I've ever been yeah. in my life, yeah. America or Jamaica. Yeah, you know, I, I was talking to my brother. He's, he's from New York City. And um, you know, he and his wife was always, oh, New York, and New York, and New York. And I said, you know, Atlanta. It's smaller than Memphis, but we're always compared to New York. And so, I mean, we bat above our average, man. I mean, we're, 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 we're like a real, you know, you talk about a city. I mean, just imagine Memphis with the busiest airport in the world. How many people does Memphis have? Memphis has like 456 
thousand or something oh, like right. that. So they're just bigger than than Atlanta is. You know, we're smaller than Atlanta. We're smaller than Charlotte. We're smaller than Jacksonville. You know, but none of those cities yeah. are basically. They can't touch Atlanta. You know, the second largest concentration of Fortune 500 companies anywhere in the country outside of New York City. Like, I tell companies, foreign companies that are looking to go to market in the U.S., go to Atlanta. And I'm not just saying that because that's my city. But if you want to engage large Fortune 500 companies and you want to do it with the least amount of noise, Mm -hmm. you want to come to Atlanta. You want to get those same companies in New York, you won't even get in the door. You won't get past the lobby. So It's not Connecticut anymore, like Hartford and, right. and those little places Atlanta. and you know, little loopholes. Atlanta, you know, you got the you got the Coca-Colas and the Home Depots and the Sun Trust and the uh the NCRs and the New York Stock Exchange. New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> you know, Every got, exchange yeah. goes through Sandy Springs. That's it. Yeah, you got yeah, I mean, you know, something like 70 Who bought them? Intercontinental, Intercontinental Exchange. Exchange. No, I, I actually interviewed the CEO. Kelly Leffler. Yeah. Right. What's her husband's name? Jeff, Jeff Sprucker. Sprucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, that's when I met Rodney Mims Cook. You know him? Uh, Rodney Mims Cook Jr.? Man, He's the owner of the Millennium Gate Museum. That Archer Titus. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's how I met him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's who I met, like, a lot of these people. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I was working for a media company in college and we did this build out um, or filming of the build out of Men's Park okay. in Vine City. Right. Awesome. Wow. One of the ways that I got to see how impoverished West Atlanta is. Yes. Yeah. Early on. Yeah. And you know, I think I think we really need a, a poverty strategy that True. doesn't rely on uh, subsidizing and trying to make their lives um, uh, more comfortable, but focuses on moving them out of poverty. You know, my mom, um, my grandmother, um, my grandmother got her GED when she was 50 years old. Oh, yeah. And my mom got her, her diploma when she was 28 or something, almost 30 years old. My sure. aunt, my mom's sister, was uh, 24 years old. They all did it around the same time. My mom went on to become a registered nurse. My grandmother went on to become a licensed practical nurse. Um, and what that meant is a family that was in poverty went from poverty to middle class because of, of that. Education. And now what happened is we moved from New Jersey where she did this to Florida to have a home built. So now the key is for Atlanta to have a workforce development program that can move people out of poverty and into career paths the same way New Jersey did for my mom, but keep them there, right? Because she took all that and went to Florida. But if Atlanta can right. do that and keep them here and then taking that affordable housing component can keep them here. So now they can move out of their apartment into a home that's affordable. Then now you have that poverty rate going down. But that's life changing stuff, right? That's not just, um, you know, a political talking point. You know, my my brothers who are younger than me, my the, the brother closest to me is five years younger than me, and then one year younger than him is another brother that's Clarence and Terrence, and then Chris and Charles are one year younger than them, right? You, how many siblings? Six. six? Yeah. You're one of seven. I'm one of six. One of six? On that side, and then I have two sisters from another father. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> but my brother Clarence, Terrence, Chris, and Charles don't remember poverty. That, that's Old Testament, New Testament stuff, mm-hmm. right? So to me, that's where we need to be, right? Forget banning cigarette smokes in Atlanta or no more scooter rides after nine. That's bullshit. Right. We need to be focused on big, transformative things and I don't know what's on the dock for that right now in Atlanta and I think we if we don't know that vision what we're fighting for are we just waiting on the next thing to protest like to me what's that next big transformative thing that we're all engaged on and fighting towards that's where I think Atlanta needs to be and it's, it's tragic that we, we don't have that I couldn't agree more yeah. my platform when I ran for office yeah. was Education reform, criminal justice, mass transit. Teach kids about money at an early age, financial independence, literacy, 
And now, nutrition, actually. Yeah. Um, I couldn't think of a more vital time that people would like sell a about it. Yeah. <laughs> Truly. Yeah. I mean, you need to learn about money and food. Yeah. Food and money. Really, start with the food. That's what you're going to build off of. Yeah. I didn't know shit about it yeah. until about a year ago. Wow. So, yeah. I'd say that those are really important. I love how much you yeah. talked about the ECEs. Yeah. So, um, how often do you take Marta? Or, I take Marta when? I don't. Don't. Uh, my son does. Nice. Uh, takes Marta. I, yeah, I don't. I drive. Yeah. And I, look, I don't believe, I believe we need mass transit. I need, believe we need comprehensive mass transit. But I don't believe we need it as an alternative to car. That's why I disagree. Mm-hmm. Not with you, but whoever. I don't believe that. My goal in having comprehensive mass transit is not to reduce the amount of cars. It's to increase the amount of options. So if I'm going somewhere, like to the basketball game, the Hawks game, I want to be able to say, I can drive there or I can park at Lindbergh and catch the train into the day. That's an option. Or I can Uber. That's an option. I can ride my bike. <laughs> that's another option. Right? Do we have the bike lanes and is it safe? I'm just saying. Did you read about Keisha buying two Escalades last week with cop car money? I did. 190,000. Yeah. I did. 200 grand. I and she takes 100 cop cars off the road. But I don't have a problem. I, I knew when we ran. Uh, Just like you see, we did. Literally ago. the same thing that yeah. he did. We ran three years ago. I knew we probably needed. Hey, look, I, let me tell you what I want to see. I want to see the Atlanta mayor have a, a, a mayor's mansion, right? Um, where that family can cool move into that. And I think we need, look, we are, we want to be a global city. We want to be a top line city. We want to be a really dope city on the scale of New York. So if somebody who is a foreign dignitary or a foreign, you know, billionaire comes and go to that to New York, you know, where are they staying? How are they being treated? And are they getting that same presence when they come to Atlanta? And so to me, I feel like I, I'd like to see that. But that's me trying to convince taxpayers. But, you know, there's enough vacant mansions around here we can get a billionaire to donate a mansion to the mayor, uh, to the to the mayor's office and, and ha- to house our mayor, I think. But that's me. So to me, I didn't, when I saw it, I didn't have a problem with it. Again, let me tell you what I think the problem is. What are we contrasting it with? Mm-hmm. What are we doing out here? What, what are we doing, really? What's the big picture? What's the big picture? No one knows that. And so then when it flashes up, two escalates, what? You know what I mean? Like, that's the big picture. Like, we don't have, we don't have any to the contracts with the day. That's the big thing. Oh, that's the freaking truth, man. Yeah, that's so you got to run for office again? again? Man, I'm done. You're done? I'm going to help other people run for office. Mm. You know, let's try to shape the landscape and, you know, try to influence the thinkers, the, the uh, thinking of elected officials. I'm done, man. I've been rejected by the people three times. I get the picture. And, uh, I don't think it's a rejection, Mr. Rude. <laughs> what is it? I mean, <laughs> I, ran, I know you ran against Matt Westmoreland. Yeah. And he, you know, it's a political dynasty family. Like. Yeah, I think, I think um, things, not, not just in that race, but in the three races I ran. I ran in one race that I felt like I really had a, a chance to win, like a front runner's chance to win. Uh, it was when I ran for Fulton County Commission. Okay. I got in, I got a great team. Incidentally, the same team Brian Kemp had, a uh, campaign team. And we had a great strategy. We had great donors. Uh, we raised good money. Um, and we're ready to go. And then Lee Moore steps in the race, who is a legend. Uh, in local politics in, in Bucket. Which district? District 4. 4? Is that Natalie's? Natalie Well, Hall? they changed the... Is she 4? I think she's 4. No, no, no. She's 2. She is now. No, she's 4. Yeah. No, she is now, but at the time, she wasn't. They changed the... You're all right. Yeah. So, she wasn't even going to run, right? Yeah. And she, then Kwanzaa, like, dropped out of the mayor race and she jumped in, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. 
I love her too, by the no, way. She's, I see her yeah. all the time. She's, doing a great she's job. a true civic servant. Yeah. I can't wait to have her on the podcast. She's doing a great job, yeah. So yeah, I I I feel like um, you know, Lee got that race, Lee, I mean, I I would be talking to people. I make be making phone calls, we talk to people and they would be like, Oh my god, I am definitely voting for you. Who's your opponent? And then Lee Moore. Lee Moore is ah uh, Lee put street lights on our street. I mean, like, he looked, he deserved to win, you know, but no one expected him to get into the race. He thought he, he was retired. Mm. So to me, it, yeah, I don't think it was a rejection, all of them. Um, I think the city council race was a long shot. We needed basically to play the best game we ever played, and we needed Matt to fumble the ball a few times. Right. Um, and then running for Congress. I didn't even run for Congress. I, I was for Congress. I mean, that wasn't. I don't even count that as a as a rate. That was my four way into politics. Mm. That's how I learned the Atlanta pop political scene. I guess I kind of could have did it another way, but it what it did for me is it gave elected officials and serious uh, political influencers in the Atlanta area and in Georgia in general a chance to see me on the stump. And like I said, with Brian Kemp, he would see me at events. I, I have to give speech. He has to give a speech. You know, when you run for office, you're all just candidates. You know, it oh, doesn't yeah. matter. Get that stump speech ready. Yeah. So see me on the base. See me. See you know. They, they're like, okay, this guy has political talent, and so I built a network, a political network, based off of just people saying, you know, I think he has a future in politics. Mm -hmm. So I think we, along the way, gained a lot. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right, so list these in order of your favorite. Braves, Hawks, Falcons, United. Um, Falcons. Tremendously disappointing. Mm. Uh, incidentally, um, my wife and I watched the Falcons, big Falcons fan, and we were watching the Falcons when Calvin Ridley was a rookie, and we I mean, instantly, big Calvin Ridley fan. So, one day, um, my nanny comes home and says, I would come to, to the house and says, you know, Atlanta Falcon is moving into the neighborhood. It turns out to be Calvin no Ridley. Way. So, he lives like three houses down from me now. That's the coolest thing. Just, we're like kids walking and so driving in and out of the neighborhood, you know. Oh, there he is! Yeah. <laughs> um, so, it's unfortunate that he... So, Falcon first. So, Falcon first. And then I would say the Hawks. I'm a mm -hmm. season ticket holder there. Uh, I'm also. I saw you up there. I, have, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't buy them. I, I tried out one. Really? And yeah. Then, for the season. <clears throat> you got to do the big heads. Mm -hmm. uh, which I tried to get for my campaign, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah dude. Those are good. <clears throat> um, Braves so Falcons, versus Hawks, uh, United. United. I've never been to a United game. It seems like it's bananas. Lit. Bananas. So, I but, did it at Bobby Dodd at Tech, which is like all, one of the most beautiful, awesome views in the whole city. Yeah. yeah Holy smokes. Yeah. Um, and then you know at the stadium or the Mercedes. Well, I'm I am not a fan of soccer, um, but I'm a fan of the, the atmosphere. Right. right. I go with the Braves over the United, but the United still have to, to sell me. Now I will. I will give you a secret. Let's hear it. When we ran for city council, I found some market research that the Atlanta United did, how they came up with their name. And so I took that as my theme, United Atlanta. So um, because of the market research behind it, I was trying to figure out what's the message that Atlanta wants to hear. And it was like, all oh, this market research, like, well, there it is. People want Atlanta to be united. Mm -hmm. And initially, I put Atlanta, period, United, period. My lawyers was like, no. Like, do you want to get a cease and desist from freaking Arthur Blank in the middle of a campaign? It's like, probably not. So <laughs> you flipped them and just said United Atlanta. So, but that's the- uh, That's solid. Yeah. Where'd yeah. you get that market it, research? It was in, uh, it was online and it was published by like some newspaper public. Cause more than just Atlanta, has it. So there's a couple of, within the soccer, Major League Soccer, there's a couple of um, cities that have that name, United. Mm -hmm. 
Like, right. Yeah, know, yeah. Minnesota yeah. United or something like that. A few of New York. Yeah. Um, so who do I need to have on next? Who would you recommend? I think, um, you know, to talk about local Atlanta politics, uh, Fred Hicks, and you probably heard him on NPR. Okay. I think Darren Johnson, mm. um, really good. Um, <clears throat> I think um, bringing somebody on uh, like um, Nick Love okay. would be dope. Awesome. To come up. Um, it's a different kind of Atlanta culture. Um, He's more Atlanta street culture. Good. Uh, you know, let, I think you should look him up. Okay, so, yeah, I will. For I, sure. I'll leave it at, at Nick Love. Bet. Yeah. All right, so where can everybody find you online? Um, I think Instagram is the best place, and that's uh, at Corey.Roof. And it's Corey with, with uh, no E and Roof like Babe Ruth. Mm. Yeah, like C-O-R-Y that. period R-U-T-H. That's it, yeah. Excellent. Cool. Mr. Roof. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate Honor and pleasure. Awesome. Signing out. Woo-wee! That was a doozy. Hope y'all enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Thank you so much for tuning in this whole time. Please screenshot and share on your social media platforms, however you're listening to this. And let me know what you think.